Oh, Canada. When we think of this frosty home and native land of 40 million citizens, we often picture mounted policemen, vast wilderness, maple syrup, and a polite, friendly population. However, beneath this charming exterior lies a dark history that is gradually being uncovered and brought to light thanks to new archaeological technology. On July 15, 2021, in Kamloops, British Columbia, Dr. Sarah Beaulieu used ground penetrating radar, GPR, to confirm the existence of around 200 potential unmarked graves of indigenous children at a former residential school. This grim discovery highlighted the tragic history of Canada's residential school system, which forcibly attended over 150,000 indigenous children. The Kamloops discovery spurred nationwide efforts to map unmarked graves at 139 residential school sites across Canada. GPR technology, which detects underground anomalies, has been crucial in identifying these graves without disturbing them, respecting indigenous beliefs. High accuracy global navigation system servers, receivers, and geographic information systems technology have provided precise locations, aiding in the acknowledgement and remembrance of the children who never returned home. So what was the Canadian Indian residential school system? Well, it was a network of boarding schools for indigenous children funded by the Canadian government and administered by various Christian churches. It was active from the 1880s until 1996, when the last school, the Gordon School in Punichi, Saskatchewan closed. The system aimed to assimilate indigenous children by erasing their culture, language, and identity. Reports of abuse, neglect, and deaths were known within indigenous communities but largely ignored until recent efforts to uncover the truth. By the 1930s, about 30% of indigenous children attended these schools, with estimates of deaths ranging from 3,200 to over 30,000, mostly due to disease. The system originated from pre-Confederation laws, beginning with the Gradual Civilization Act, which aimed to assimilate Aboriginal Canadians into European Canadian society. This effort was solidified with the Indian Act of 1876 and its 1894 amendment, making attendance compulsory for First Nations children. Schools were often located far from indigenous communities to minimize family contact, supported by policies like the past system that restricted indigenous peoples to reserves. Starting with three industrial schools on the prairies in 1883, the system expanded over the next half century to span much of Canada. Most schools were in the four Western provinces and the territories, with significant numbers in Northwestern Ontario and Northern Quebec. New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island had no schools, as the government believed indigenous people there had already assimilated into Euro-Canadian culture. At its peak around 1930, the residential school system comprised 80 institutions. The Roman Catholic Church operated three-fifths of these schools, the Anglican Church ran one quarter, and the United and Presbyterian churches managed the remainder. Before 1925, the Methodist Church also operated residential schools. But when the United Church of Canada was formed in 1925, most of the Presbyterian and all the Methodist schools became United Church schools. So how was a typical day at school? Until the late 1950s, residential schools operated on a half-day system with students spending half the day in classrooms and the other half working. This work, divided by gender, involved girls in housekeeping tasks like cooking and cleaning, while boys handled carpentry, construction, and agricultural labor. The purpose was more about keeping the schools running cheaply than providing vocational training. The daily routine at residential schools began early, with a bell summoning students to dress and attend chapel or mass, followed by chores, often referred to as fatigue duty, before a quick Spartan breakfast. After breakfast, students attended three hours of classes or performed work tasks. The afternoon followed a similar pattern with classes or work, interspersed with chores before supper. Evenings included time for recreation, such as organized sports or music instruction, and ended with prayer and an early bedtime. Weekends had no classes, but involved more religious practices on Sundays. Until the 1960s, students rarely went home for holidays often not seeing their families for years. The education provided was subpar with underqualified, overworked, and poorly paid teachers delivering a basic curriculum that emphasized the four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion in English or French, languages many students did not speak. 
Vocational training was minimal, with harsh overseers and little real skill development. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report in 2015 highlighted several failures of the residential school system. The federal government failed to set clear educational goals and standards. The curriculum was elementary and based on the belief that indigenous people were intellectually inferior. Teacher qualifications were not addressed adequately. Teaching staff were underqualified and poorly paid. The curriculum was irrelevant to the students' needs. Many students left without the skills to succeed in their communities or the broader labor market. Residential schools also inflicted significant harm by removing children from their families, depriving them of their languages, and exposing them to abuse. Conditions led to malnutrition, disease, and death. Students forced to speak English or French often found themselves unable to reintegrate into their communities while facing racism in mainstream society. Forced to occupy a tragic no man's land with nowhere they could really call home. The system disrupted the transmission of indigenous culture, leading to widespread post-traumatic stress, substance abuse, and intergenerational trauma in indigenous communities. Many students suffered severe abuse at residential schools, facing excessive physical punishment for minor infractions. Children were often beaten, chained, or confined. Sexual abuse was rampant, with many staff members being sexual predators. When allegations of sexual abuse were reported, the responses from government and church officials were grossly inadequate. Often the police were not involved, and at best, perpetrators were merely fired or allowed to continue working. According to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, at least 3,200 indigenous children died in the overcrowded residential schools, with estimates possibly exceeding 6,000 due to poor record keeping. It is these children who have been found in unmarked graves like in Kamloops. Malnutrition and inadequate food quality made students particularly susceptible to diseases like tuberculosis and influenza. The school's menus were monotonous and nutritionally deficient, exemplified by a diet that often consisted of, quote, mush, 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 end quote, according to Basil Johnston, a former student who described his subpar culinary experiences at a residential school in Ontario in his book, Indian School Days. Worst of all, though, in the 1940s and 1950s, students were subjected to non-consensual nutritional experiments approved by federal departments, which restricted essential nutrients and dental care, further compromising their health. Outbreaks of diseases such as tuberculosis, influenza, smallpox, measles, typhoid, diphtheria, pneumonia, and whooping cough frequently plagued the schools. In the winter of 1926-27, 13 children died from measles and whooping cough at the Lytton School. The outbreaks ravaged the school so badly that Louise Moyne, a former student of Kuapel School, recalled how there was a death every month on the girls' side and some of the boys went also. In the late 2000s, Canadian politicians and religious communities began acknowledging their roles in the residential school system, with Prime Minister Stephen Harper issuing a public apology in 2008. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established the same year and gathered 7,000 survivor testimonies. Its 2015 report concluded that the system amounted to cultural genocide. In July 2022, during a penitential pilgrimage to Canada, Pope Francis reiterated the Catholic Church's apologies, acknowledging the system as genocide. In October 2022, the Canadian House of Commons unanimously passed a motion recognizing the residential school system as genocide. The legacy of residential schools remains a deeply painful chapter in Canadian history, continuing to impact Indigenous communities today, with many survivors offering their stories. Paul Dixon, a residential school survivor from the Cree community of Waswanipi, Quebec, shared his harrowing experiences with CBC. At six years old, he was forcibly taken from his home by an Indian agent, a mounted policeman, a priest, and a nun. At the Mohawk Institute Residential School, and later Latouk Residential School, which he attended, children were separated by gender, had their hair cut, and suffered physical and emotional abuse. The harsh conditions included rigid routines, poor nutrition, and forced labor, leaving deep psychological scars and intergenerational trauma. Dixon recalls how children were identified by numbers instead of names and severely punished for speaking their native language. The discovery of unmarked graves, including 215 at Kamloops, highlights the ongoing pain within indigenous communities. 
Dixon's healing journey involved reconnecting with his Cree heritage, sobriety, and the support of his community and family. His story underscores the need to acknowledge this dark chapter in Canadian history and continue efforts toward truth and reconciliation. Daniel Kennedy, born Ochankugahe, described his harrowing experience at the Coapel Residential School in Quebec in his memoirs, Recollections of an Assiniboine Chief, 1972. In 1886, at the age of 12 years, I was lassoed, roped, and taken to the government school at Labrette, Kennedy recalled. He recounted the profound loss of his identity upon arrival. Six months after I enrolled, I discovered to my chagrin that I had lost my name and an English name had been tagged on me in exchange. The school's interpreter later explained, we are going to civilize him, so we will give him a civilized name. Kennedy vividly remembered the painful cultural assimilation. They went to work and cut off my braids. According to the Assiniboine traditional custom, was a token of mourning. I wondered in silence if my mother had died. His reflection on seeing his altered appearance was poignant. A Halloween pumpkin stared back at me, and that did it. If this was civilization, I didn't want any part of it. Despite multiple escape attempts, Kennedy was repeatedly captured and forced to stay. He eventually resigned himself to learning the three R's, emphasizing the drastic contrast between his traditional upbringing and the harsh school environment. Visualize for yourselves the difficulties encountered by an Indian boy who had never seen the inside of a house who had lived in buffalo skin teepees in winter and summer, who grew up with a bow and arrow. So how is Canada coming to terms with its sordid past? Well, since 2016, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has the Imagine a Canada program. This program has engaged over 1,500 students to try to reform Canada into a reconciled nation among younger generations. The 2024 Imagine a Canada National Celebration allowed students to showcase their ideas on how to overcome this historical trauma. Students submitted art, essays, and project plans with the best 25 submissions chosen. Can Canada ever truly reconcile with its past? We love hearing your comments, so let us know below whether you think Canada is doing enough to heal the wounds in its society. What more could be done? Do you have a story from a relative who survived the residential school system to share?